Well, good morning, everyone. I hope you've had a good Christmas break and are ready to get back at it this semester. I'm looking forward to working with each of you this term and here in this course, Enterprise Programming. I think we have a lot of things to do, and we want to uh, jump right into it here in just a few seconds. I'm sending around a roster for everyone to uh, be able to sign in. Um, the roster shows your legal name. If you want me to update it to reflect a different first name, uh, you'll see there's a slot for you to be able to fill that in there, and I will do that for all uh, future sheets and other course information. Uh, I trust all of you received an email from me a few days ago containing your uh, account information for this class. If you did not get that, uh, check with me, let me know so that I can resend it to you. But I saw a lot of people shaking their head that yes, they did in fact get that. Uh, we have a busy semester <coughs> ahead, but I, I know that we'll cover a lot of things that um, should be interesting for you. And then also, uh, depending upon what you are thinking about in terms of future job prospects, uh, the things that we cover in this class will be very uh, useful for you in that regard, and I'll say more about that here in, in just a few moments. We'll meet in this room every time. Uh, I've scheduled to meet 9.45 till 11.05, so about an hour and 20 minutes. Um, if we ever have a situation, and I, I hope this won't happen, where I'm not here at a 9.45, and I haven't emailed you to say that class is canceled or anything like that, uh, send someone down to the office to check. Uh, I don't anticipate this happening, but if I ever get caught at the last minute involved in something for the department, um, if you send somebody down there, they can check and see what the situation is. I don't know that I have any other preliminary things to announce to you guys. Uh, any questions you have before we uh, jump into our first discussion, which will tell you more about what we're going to be up to this term. Yes, sir. Yes, I am recording this session and uh, we'll be putting it out on YouTube and I'll do like I did in the class last semester for those of you that were in 4757, where in D2L I will put uh, a link to each of the YouTube videos in a news announcement. Um, hopefully that makes it easy for you to find things as sometimes on YouTube things wind up categorized in a, a way that sometimes it's challenging to find things. But barring any kind of technical difficulties, uh, we will have a recording for each class section as well. So, Other questions? All right, well, um, let me, before we jump into our first slide deck, talk to you a little bit about kind of the logistics for the class. This is a programming class. Your homework will be to write computer programs. You will find that ABAP programs in general are, are not very long. I would guess that most of the programs that you will write this semester would easily fit on a single sheet of paper if printed out. The longest program we might write uh, near the end of the semester uh, might take up two pieces of paper. ABAP programs tend to be very short because ABAP is, as we'll discuss here fairly shortly, a fourth generational programming language. That means that it has a lot of words in the language um, and therefore, if you know the syntax, you can do in just a few very short lines of code uh, things that would take much longer to do in other programming languages. By the time we finish this semester, uh, you will have a, a strong foundation in the fundamentals of ABAP uh, such that you would be able to go into a company and take a developer position and kind of grow your career from there. And in fact, many of uh, the students that have sat where you are sitting in previous semesters have done just that because ABAP development is something that is not commonly known. It is in high <coughs> demand and it tends to pay very, very well as a career. And so uh, my comment to you is do well in your studies this semester and uh, it's very likely that 
you know, the top few students in this class, if they elect to pursue uh, a career in ABAP development, uh, may find that this leads them into a very, very nice position uh, shortly in the future. Perhaps more so than any other SAT skill, ABAP development is one that is more rare and in much greater demand as, as a result. So there is uh, a lot of opportunity associated with what we're going to talk about this semester. As we go along uh, this semester, we will write a lot of code together. Um, we may put some things on the whiteboard from time to time, but we'll try and do most of the things uh, on the computer so that it gets captured in the class recordings. As we go along, please do ask questions. Uh, I would expect that there'll be a lot of that as the semester goes on. Um, so if there's ever anything that I mention or show you that you would like to see more of or would like further clarification, please don't in any way hesitate. Please feel free. Hopefully everyone has the, the course textbook. Uh, it looks like this. Uh, this is a, a brand new book. It's only been out, I, I think, about, well, I think less than two months at this point. And I picked this book in particular because it is a very, very uh, contemporary resource. One of the things that um, is challenging about ABAP is, first of all, there aren't a lot of books out there. It's not like Java or C where there are hundreds if not thousands of books. ABAP, the number of books that are out there can be numbered in the tens. And some of the books are older and cover previous versions of the language. ABAP is a language that does get frequently updated. All of the old code is still valid and able to be run, but the newer techniques often afford um, some very, very interesting new programming constraints. And the latest version of ABAP, which we will be using, is what this book uh, presents. And in fact, there are things that we will talk about this semester that as of the last time this class was taught were not available in the language. So ABAP does ever evolve. This book right here, I would suggest if you find someone who is a professional ABAP developer, they probably have this book on their bookshelf or have it on their wish list to get because it does afford us a, fairy, a fairly thorough coverage of the language. Um, there are a lot of chapters in this book, and you'll note that pretty much your homework for this semester will consist of not only writing computer programs like I've talked about, but also reading chapters in the textbook. You will notice the reading schedule for the entire semester is out, and once we get past midterms, after I think it's about two weeks past the midterm, uh, we'll be done with the book. So here early in the semester, we're doing a lot of reading in the book, uh, but we'll, we'll kind of get through it, and then you won't have uh, any of that later in the semester. There are some chapters in the book which we will not read, uh, but for the most part, we'll cover all of the things here, at least in your reading, and, and most of these things we will cover in class discussion. So that's all I can think of by way of kind of an overview of the course. Any any questions before we jump into our our first discussion here? Yes, sir. Do any of the reading started with ABAP? No. Like the domain development framework. Um, it it you if you pulled up an old syllabus, you might have seen it there. Pretty much every time I've taught this course, we've we've changed to a newer book. But no, the book that I just showed you. Is, is the one that we'll be using this semester. Mm -hmm. Other questions? All right, well, I am really looking forward to uh, working with you guys. This is probably my uh, favorite class to teach. Uh, we cover a lot of really, really cool stuff. It'll give you an opportunity to uh, kind of refresh some of the programming skills that perhaps you haven't used in other classes recently and kind of do some different kind of programming than perhaps you've done in a while. So I really do uh, hope and think this will be a profitable class for you. What is it we do in this class? Just to kind of give you an overview of, of the goals of this course. We are going to be learning, of course, a contemporary programming language. So even if 
you wind up not doing ABAP development in the future, it never hurts to add another programming course to your repertoire uh, for the sake of just brushing up on programming skills. Uh, for the most part, and maybe you've experienced this already, learning your first programming language is usually pretty hard. Your second programming language is a little bit easier, but then usually by the time you've learned three or four programming languages, it becomes much, much easier to pick up new languages because you can do things like say, oh, this is just like this, but here's how it's different. And so there's always value in learning a new programming language, and so this class will give you an opportunity to experience that. This course is also going to give you an opportunity to do something that you probably have not done in other courses that you've taken here at ETSU, and that is program in an environment where there's already a lot of other stuff in place. A lot of uh, database resources, a lot of data structures, an extensive data dictionary, and you'll be leveraging those things in your development. So you'll be using things that are already established, and then you'll be creating things, some things that will strictly have the duration of the program that you write, but then other things that will become persistent things in the development environment as well. And that carries with it some um, awareness that we need to have in our development. First of all, to make sure that we don't break anything that other people are using or relying on or the system is relying on, but then also um, giving us the opportunity to, to leverage resources and keep us from having to recreate everything from scratch ourselves each time. So you're going to get that kind of experience in developing in an established framework. Um, like I was talking about just a moment ago, you'll get the opportunity to learn a new programming language. And there's a lot of things we'll do this semester that will just give you an opportunity to review things you already know, such as object-oriented programming. ABOP can be written both procedurally and object-oriented, and we kind of bounce back and forth depending upon what it is that we are doing. So we'll start with procedural ABOP, but very shortly we'll move into object-oriented ABOP. So this will give you some practice in your object-oriented programming. We will do a lot of database-related development. Mainly that's going to involve things like creating database tables um, and then using them in various development activities through things such as querying and things of that sort. We won't necessarily be doing very, very complex database development, but it will give you an opportunity to do a lot of different things in database programming. You'll work with a data dictionary, we'll do some event-driven programming, so you'll get an opportunity to review a lot of things that you have hopefully already done in other classes. And as I was saying a moment ago, perhaps the, the most interesting thing, at least for some of you, is the opportunity that this affords in the way of, of potential future job opportunities. And just to share with you an example of, of what I'm talking about, this is an email that uh, at this point is uh, a couple of years old. Hang on a second, I've got to adjust some things on my laptop here, there we go. This is an email I got a, a few years ago at this point from a, a graduate who uh, took a position here at a company in the area, Eastman Chemical, doing ABOP development. And in fact, uh, since this particular student, um, every time I've taught this course, there have been students hired not only at, at Eastman, but at other companies in this area. Uh, we have several ABOP developers that are at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville uh, doing development for them. We have ABOP developers at Oak Ridge National Laboratories, Y12, a variety of other companies in this area. And very frequently I get contacted by companies outside of this area looking for ABOP developers because it's not something that is, is very commonly taught. Some of you may know this from things I've mentioned in other courses, but ETSU is a member of the SAP University Alliances. That gives us uh, the resources that we use in this class and, and you have used in other classes before. Well, there are 
I couldn't give you a number, but surely there are hundreds of universities across the United States that in some way teach with SAP. Um, the activity that you did in a previous class where you played the ERP sim simulation, that is something that is very commonly used for reasons that you probably all understand. It's fun, it's an interesting way to get to know about SAP. And so there's a lot of universities using that tool. <coughs> when we start talking about ABOP development, at one point I could have given you a definitive list. I don't know that I could do that anymore. But I feel pretty confident in saying that across the United States, there are fewer than 20 universities that teach ABOP development. Um, and that's because um, most of the use of SAP is not in departments that have a heavy uh, computer programming focus like we do here. A lot of universities use things like ERP SIM in their MIS courses or things like that, but they don't get into the more technical elements. So that puts you in fairly rare company once again, as there just aren't a lot of universities out there training uh, ABOP developers. So my point is there are job opportunities in this area uh, for top performers and there are job opportunities elsewhere. Now do understand that we are in right now a fairly competitive job market, which means that I'm not telling you if you pass this class you will get a job, I'm telling you if you do well in this course and really have some skills to demonstrate uh, your chances of getting a job are, are quite exceptional. But companies still can pick and choose. And so uh, to the extent that you really learn this material and do well, uh, you will position yourself for, for success. There is a company in this area that I will not name that hires me to do ABOP development for or ABOP training for uh, their new developers. The resources that we use in this class are pretty much the same resources I use in training for that organization. So when I tell you that the skills that you will use will prepare you for a job, uh, I'm, I'm being totally honest and candid with you about that and can bring in a steady stream of past graduates who, who can verify that to be the case. So there's an opportunity here to the extent that you want to pursue that is of course up to you, but I think it is something uh, that is well worth you putting some thought into. And I think, and you can tell me whether I'm wrong, give me two or three weeks before you come to a conclusion about this, but ABOP development is actually pretty enjoyable. As a matter of fact, the ABOP developer that is at, well, I'll be vague, one of the companies that I mentioned that would be one of our top graduates from the last decade or so, uh, this individual at one point came to me and said, I did not want to be a programmer. If you told me that after I graduated I would take a job in programming, I would have told you you were crazy. But this individual really enjoyed ABOP and went out and got a job in ABOP development and is still doing it today and is very, very happy with the career that uh, they have been able to carve out. So even if you're coming into this and you're thinking, well, I don't really like programming, uh, give ABOP a chance because I think you'll see that it may be very, very different than what you have experienced with other programming languages. All right, so before I jump into this, any quick questions? I'll pause periodically and ask if there are questions but certainly uh, at any point you're welcome to uh, stick your hand up and get my attention and, and stop me if I'm rolling along. All right, so why do we need ABOP? What, what does it do for us? And some of the concepts we're gonna talk about here uh, in the next few minutes, if you have taken CSCI 4757, you'll, you'll recognize some of this as being familiar. So a company goes out and they buy an ERP system. An ERP system on purpose is written very generically because companies want to be able to sell it to as many potential customers as they can. So if, if a, 
an ERP development company, whether we're talking SAP or any other company, if they went out and said, let's develop this software package so that it could be used by retail stores. Well, that would be great if you ran a retail store, but then other kinds of businesses wouldn't have any value in buying that software. So what ERP companies do is they write software in a way that it can support a wide variety of different kinds of businesses, which means that when a company buys an ERP system, they have to fit it to their particular needs and their particular requirements. Now, in so doing, there are lots of different ways that we can tune the system to meet our needs, some of which are pretty trivial and some of which are, are rather extensive. Personalization is the most basic kind of system to meet a company's needs. And in fact, personalization is actually typically done by the end user and, and not actually someone in IT or, or development. And all personalization is, is when a user uses the system, they can tell it to things like automatically fill in values in certain fields. They can tell it um, on this particular screen, hide these particular fields because I don't need to see them. They can do things like in the SAP GUI, creating a favorites folder that just has a collection of transactions they use, almost like bookmarking a page in a web browser. So personalization is very, very basic. For example, maybe I work in a company and I work in company code A1. Well, I can tell the computer, hey, anytime you're showing me a screen and there's a field there that asks me what company code I want to look at information for, just go ahead and automatically fill in A1 every time. And if I ever need to change that, I will, but go ahead and put that in there by default. Well, those are personalizations that can be done by the end user. They are per user, so every end user could have something a little bit different, but that's a way that we could fit an ERP system to our particular needs, and that's something that's, that's pretty commonly done. Now, when we move into the realm of what IT personnel typically do for an organization, now we're moving into the realm of configuration. And for those of you that have taken CSCI 4757 Information Systems Implementation, you've seen this. This is what we do in that course. The idea behind configuration is inherent in the software package itself are controls that allow us to set up how we want the software to work. We can specify the sequencing of steps in a business process. We can set up our financial accounting functionality to record transactions the way we want them to be recorded. That's something that is beyond the ability of the end user to do, but is, is not something that requires us to actually do any programming. We're simply using uh, menu pathways and transactions to go into the system and adjust functionality that is already present by the developers because they know that these are the kinds of things that companies will typically want to set up. But the challenge we face is sometimes there are things that we want the software to do that isn't a part of the functionality. It's perhaps something that is unique to our company or unique to the way we want to execute a business process. So what if we need something and we need it to be a part of our ERP system, but we can't get there through configuration? Then we have some choices. One of the choices that we have is called modification. Modification, you'll also notice, is referred to synonymously as customization. And in modification, we actually change the core software to reflect different customer execution. We are going in 
and we are actually modifying the software. Now, you might say, how can we do that? Well, one of the things that I will show you here in a few minutes and that we will observe this semester is SAP ERP is open source software. Now, that doesn't mean that you can go out to some, you know, SourceForge or other web re related resource and download it. We're, we're not saying that it is publicly available open source software, but SAP ERP is in fact open source, meaning that you can drill down and look at the source code. And you can drill down and change the source code. That's what we're talking about here when we're talking about modification. Changing the software to reflect a way that we want the software to behave differently than it does out of the box. That's customization. Now, there are some dangers associated with modification or customization. What do you think those dangers might be? What's one of them? Okay, this is not trivial software. We're talking millions of lines of code. If you go in there and start changing things, you run the risk of creating a ripple effect where what you change actually breaks something else. That's obviously not good. Why else could this be problematic? What do come, yes sir. Yes. Absolutely. To the extent that we go in here and modify the core software, what happens when SAP in this instance or any other ERP company, if we're talking about doing this with their software, what happens when they release the next version or the next patch or the next security update? there's a chance that either A, that might wipe out what we have done, or B, there's a chance that what we have done might not be compatible with this newest update. So there's a lot of risks here associated with modification. So even though this is a tool that is available to us, it, it's definitely something we need to be very, very careful about. Now, another alternative that we have is enhancement. Enhancement, notice how it's distinct from modification. We're not going in and changing the core software. What we're doing is going in and adding to it. So we're not disrupting any of the standard code that SAP wrote, but in fact, we're adding our own new code to go along with it to fulfill a particular requirement that, that we had. Let me give you an example of this that all of you experienced and hopefully you can remember. When you were playing ERP SIM, you ran a transaction to go in and redo the formulation of your particular muesli. You might add more blueberries or reduce the amount of wheat or whatever have you. Now you might remember perhaps you experienced this or saw someone on your team experience this, that when you finished making your bill of materials update and you went to save and exit, the system did a check on that formula and if your new proposed formula was not valid within certain constraints, it would reject the change. That's an example of enhancement. The transaction to change the bill of materials is a standard SAP transaction. But the added enhancement was, before that particular transaction did its final save, there was code inserted by the developers of ERP SIM to check the new bill of materials to make sure that it conformed with the rules that they had created. And it then decided whether to accept or reject the change. So it was a standard SAP ERP transaction, 
with elements added to it to match our company needs. That would be an example of enhancement. Sometimes companies find that there is things that they would like to have as a part of their ERP environment that just totally isn't a part of their system. Customer development, and I'll sometimes refer to this as custom development, basically synonymous terms, calls for us to go in and, and we're not adding to things that are already there, but we're creating our own unique things that may leverage some pieces of code that exist in the system, or rather may use some existing database tables or things of that sort, but uh, for the most part represent things that are just our own addition. One great example I can give you of this goes back a, a few decades. Here in the States, uh, Eastman Chemical was one of the first American companies to purchase and integrate SAP into their IT infrastructure going back to the 80s. If you've ever driven by Eastman and studied their physical plant, you will discover that they use a lot of, of train cars. They do a lot of inbound product delivery and outbound product shipment via rail car. In fact, they have a small rail depot on their property that they use for managing that. <coughs> well, when they bought SAP ERP, one of the things that they wanted to do was integrate their use of rail cars into the system. And they discovered that at that time, SAP did not have any code at all related to rail car management. So they wrote their own. They developed a rail car management system, built it right into the SAP ERP environment so that end users could do the things that they needed to do in the same environment they did all of their other work. But that functionality was something that was unique to Eastman Chemical. If you went to another company and tried to run those transactions, you'd discover they didn't exist because they were things that Eastman specifically wrote to match up with their needs. That's customer development, and that's something that companies need to do very, very frequently. Now, one of the things to be very careful about, and I don't know to what degree you'll wind up reading things on the web or looking at other resources this semester, talking about ERP development, but it's unfortunate that a lot of writers are very, very lazy, if you will, or unclear about the way they use the terms configuration and customization. And they use those terms synonymously. They're not, they're not. Configuration is using the existing controls and modifying things through the use of wizards, menu pull downs, other things like that to get the system to do what we want. Whereas customization actually requires us to write code, which is a very, very different process. So I will try to be very careful in, in the way I use these terms and, and encourage you to do that as, as well. I'm going to, real quickly here, uh, log into our SAP system for the sake of something I want to show you on the uh, next slide. Hopefully you have been able to access the system successfully yourself. We are using client 313, uh, or system AB3, client 313. And uh, I'm going to log in to my account that I'll use this semester uh, for the first time here. So if you have not, oops, I thought I was logging in for the first time. Maybe I, okay, well, let's try this again. All right, let me try something a little bit different here. Okay, 
Sayyid and I'm all separate. And I saw this one happen. And I heard it on the other two segments. Yeah, it is. Okay. Let me try one more thing and then. to look at something that I can show you. Okay. So, having done that. So, I talked about a moment ago, configuration, and if you have taken uh, CSCI 4757, you're familiar with that little three uh, letter acronym there, IMG, which is the um, management tool that is the implementation management guide that is available for customers to use for configuration. And if you've used that particular research, you know there's a whole set of menus and a whole set of transactions that are specifically focused on supporting the configuration process. Well, SAP engineered their ERP product to facilitate customers being able to come in and do their own enhancement do their own modification if they would desire to do so, and, and to do their own customer development. So let's talk about modification for exception for a moment. As I have observed, all source code is open to customers and can therefore be modified. This is not recommended. All right, we've already explored that for a moment. This is like SAP has handed you a gun and said, if you want to, you can use this gun to shoot yourself in the foot. We don't recommend it, but you bought the software. If you want to do that, so be it. Now, you might say, you know, I, I just don't believe that. I don't believe that SAP has given customers the ability to go into the system and modify the source code. Let's look at this. I'm going to run transaction SW01, and I'm going to take you into a part of the system and access resources in a different way than we will the duration of this semester, so you don't really have to worry about uh, the particulars of what we're going to do here, uh, although if you ever want to recreate this yourself, certainly uh, the video for this class recording may help you with that. So I'm going to click Business uh, Objects Repository, Business Objects Organizational Types. I'm going to pull this up. And this is going to allow me to access a set of business objects that are a part of the SAP environment. Um, confusingly enough, a number of years ago, SAP bought a company called Business Objects. This has nothing to do with that. These are business objects in the context of object-oriented programming. So we, we see this repository, uh, this object browser that, that gives us one way to look at uh, some of these objects. And so I'm going to open up uh, financial accounting. And uh, oops, I'm going to attempt to open up financial accounting. Must have clicked on something else there. Let's try this again. So financial accounting, and you'll notice there's an item here called accounting document. I'm going to double click on that, and uh, you notice here business object accounting document, interfaces, key fields, attributes, methods, and events. This this kind of looks like something you might have done some things with in an object-oriented programming course. If we look at the methods associated with the accounting document. Um, get ARL data, confirm, create, display doc, edit doc, edit, so on. You can see here uh, we have a, a set of methods. Notice something here at the very top of the screen. There's a button there. SAP made their buttons not look much like buttons anymore, but you'll have to trust me that's a button even though it's just text. 
program. What happens if I click this bad boy right here? After a few moments, we are looking at the source code for this particular system object. And it's beyond our ability at the moment to understand much of what's going on here. Uh, but we can see clearly there's some computer code here related to this. Uh, notice right here on line two, do not change, okay? So it's pretty clear uh, that SAP does not really say, welcome, modify this as much as you would like, uh, but in fact, there's a source code. Now you might say, well, hold on a second. This is letting me look at the source code. Can I change the source code? Well, one of the things that you'll get very, very comfortable with doing this semester is clicking this button right here, which toggles between display and change mode and the source code editor. Right now we're in display mode. We can tell that because in display mode the background's this pale blue, whereas in change or edit mode the background's going to be white. Let's watch what happens when I click on this button right here to try and toggle into change mode. Make repairs in foreign namespaces only if they are urgent. Okay, this is SAP's little version of a keep out sign. Do you really know what you are about to do? Uh, you should only do this if this is really, really urgent. But if you want to shoot yourself in the foot, uh, okay. But now I'm asked for this right here. I'm actually asked at this point for two different things. I'm asked for a developer key associated with my username which, by the way, all of you have a developer key associated with your username. I sent it to you in the email, and you'll learn how to use that, if not later today, the next time we are together. But beyond that, I need a second level key called an access key to allow me to drill into this. This is the way that SAP keeps just any old random user from going in and monkeying with the source code. But if my company bought SAP ERP, then somebody at my company has a developer key that gives them submission, sufficient privilege that if put in there in that access key box and continue was hit, this would shift to change mode and we'd be able to edit that source code. But I don't have that level of key for this system nor do you have that level of key for this system. So all we can in fact do is look at the source code. But if we worked at a company and had licensed this software, all we would have to do is put in that other key and we would be able to change this code right here. So when I say that SAP supports modification, this is what I'm talking about. You could actually go in and modify the source code. But remember what I said before, there are millions of lines of code. For you to go in with confidence and change something that SAP written, that's really, really, really not recommended at all. So do we have any other choices? A and we do. One thing that SAP has created, which is really kind of interesting, is the concept of an exit or a user exit. And these are found all throughout programs in the SAP environment. And I'll show you that here in a moment. But let's understand the concept here. SAP has in their source code a whole collection of programs. And by the way, as you'll see this semester, Basically, everything that you have thought of before as a transaction is a program that a developer wrote. So every program that's in the SAP system has within it hooks to other code that doesn't exist unless the customer creates it. So the idea would be this. You could write a program. Let's assume that you're writing a program from scratch that has nothing to do with SAP. You're writing it maybe in Java. And you want to allow other people to follow beyond you 
and kind of modify the way your program works. And so what you do is this. At the very beginning of your program, you write a block of code that says, check to see whether the user has created a file called 12345. And if the user has created that file, run that code. If it doesn't exist, then forget about it and just keep going. And all throughout your code, you put in these calls to external entities that may or may not exist. With the idea being that if they do exist, then your program will jump out and do that code and then come back to where it was in its overall process. That's called a, a user exit. And let's take a look at some of this. I'm going to go back to our SAP ERP environment and, and show you something that you probably have never noted before. Um, let's look at the transaction for creating a customer order. Logistics, sales and distribution, sales, order, create. Okay, this is a transaction that all of you have run before um, in, in a class where typically I have as the very first lab that you do in the 3720 course. You go in, you just create a customer order. So you might remember doing this before. This is a pretty common operation. Well, down here in the bottom right corner is something called the system tray. And there's this little portion of the system tray right here that has a drop-down arrow on it. If I click that drop-down arrow, it tells me what system I'm logged into and what client and what my username is. And unfortunately, this is kind of scrolled off the right side of the projection here. Notice it says program, and it gives a name. That's the actual program that an SAP developer wrote and in fact, what it says on my screen right here is this is program SAP MV45A. That's a program in the SAP ERP environment that we are now executing and it's presenting this information to us. So, let's look at that program. So I'm gonna leave this, and by the way, you can do what I just did for any transaction in the SAP environment going to go to transaction SE80, which we will do a lot this semester because this is the ABOP development workbench. But for right now, all we care about is that program. So I'm going to adjust some of the dimensionality of my screen here. Make it a little bit more conducive to everyone being able to see everything. And I'm going to tell it that I want to look at a program. And the program I want to look at is SAP MV45A. Uh, no, I mistyped. SAP MV45. There we go. Okay. And I want to look at the source code of this program. All right. So this is that program. Now we could scroll through here. And by the way, just like what we were looking at a moment ago, if I had the necessary privilege, I could actually, I could actually change this code. But one of the things that we see here starting on line 14 you may not be able to read this i'll in a later session i'll show you how to make the type a little bit bigger but we have a block here called user exits user exits user exits they, they kind of want you to get at the point that this is going to be user exits after this and there's all of these includes well here's the way this works if I want to modify the way this transaction works, I could write a program and call it MV45A0ZZ. And I could create that 
and install that in the system. And what will happen is when this program fires up, one of the first things that it's going to do is go out and find that program and run that program. So this gives me a way to change the way this program actually operates, not by changing anything that is here, but by going in and adding my own enhancement to that. So the idea might be maybe I want to add an additional field to the screen. Maybe, for example, we have something in our company called clusters. And every time we take an order, we want to tag it with a cluster. Well, I could create the appropriate database tables and then add code here to capture information related to clusters and record that as a part of, in this case, the customer order when it goes into the, the system. Now, one of the things that SAP provides that we will use a lot this semester is something called forward navigation. It's a really nice way of moving around the system. Forward navigation allows me to double click on a reference to something in the source code, and if that is an external object, it will take me to that external object. So notice, for example, if I go to uh, line 20 and I double click on this MV45A, it's going to take a second here. Here is the shell of that file. And so all I would have to do is come down here and <laughs> between where it says, you know, output and end module right in here, put my code. And the system will call and execute that code as a part of this. Now, the great thing about this is if SAP changes their code, it's not going to disrupt this. They're still going to have the call to my code in there. And it provides a very nice segregation between officially S or official SAP written code and code written by my development team. Yes, sir. This is not a class, it's a program. And this particular, and include is basically the equivalent of another source code file. So that source code file exists. It's just all comments at this point. And so I could go in and, and I could change this to um, add my new functionality. And in fact, all throughout uh, that transaction, you know, there's these user exits at the beginning. And it's almost like if you think of a program as maybe a collection of 20 different things, before and after every one of those 20 different things, there's a user exit sitting there. So that at any point in the flow of that particular program, you can write your own program. Now, as a point of fact, we will not be doing user exit development this semester. I will show you how to write code that can serve as user exits but there's no way in a class where we have roughly 20 students and we have one source code, could we have you actually going in and writing user exits. But towards the end of your textbook, page 935, you'll see a reference here to user exits that pretty much walks you through what we have just talked about. And in fact, by the time, like I said, as you know, when you know how to write an ABAP program, putting it in the context of a user exit is about five minutes of work. Okay. So any questions about this? Oh, there's absolutely such a thing as classes. There are programming languages that are totally class, I'm trying to think of the precise term here, class-based, which means that everything in the language is an object in the context of object-oriented programming. 
um, a language that would be an example of that that probably none of you have ever developed in would be small talk. Small talk, everything is an object. Even things like numbers, those aren't individual data types, everything's an object. We have languages like Java, which clearly support object-oriented programming, but not everything in the language is an object. You have primitive data types and, and things of that sort. You have some programming languages that allow you to do procedural development and object-oriented development. If you have taken um, server-side programming and done PHP development, you can write procedural PHP, you can write object-oriented PHP. ABOP is like PHP. So you can write a totally procedural program or you can write classes which will instantiate objects. But in ABOP, you will see two things commonly happen. One is which you'll create some objects and then you'll write a procedural program that will instantiate those objects and contain your overall program flow. Or you can write um, a set of objects and the start of the program will essentially go in and call one of the methods of one of those objects and the code control flow will continue in that fashion. We can do all of that in ABOP. What we happened to look at just a moment ago is pretty old SAP code and to my knowledge is totally procedural. So there were no objects anywhere to be found in anything that we looked at most recently. Okay? Other questions? All right. Customer development. Now, customer development is what we will do the most of this semester. Customer development calls for us to write our own programs, basically starting from scratch, and install them in the system. And they exist totally separate from the other entities that are a part of the environment um, like we've just been looking at. They're a part of the same universe, but they don't interact with that code. They do something of our own, of our own utility. So, as we think about this from a, a corporate perspective, can we get done what we need to get done in executing our business processes through either configuration or personalization. If we can, then we want to do that. That's going to be the cheapest, best alternative. But if we look at that and we say there's something that we need to do that we cannot get done through configuration, well, then the next question is, is there something in the system already that's similar to what we need, it's just not a perfect match. Does the underlying application allow you to add functionality? So if I can find something that's like 95% what I'm looking for, does the underlying application allow me to add that 5%? And notice this particular slide is, is not SAP specific. You could follow this same process in any enterprise information system. So the answer to this question in the context of SAP ERP is, yeah, there is a provision for me to go in and, and engage in enhancement through user exits, like we were just looking at. So if there's something that's similar to what I need, but I just need to add on some additional functionality, then enhancement is the way to go. Is there something, so maybe I, I can't get there through enhancement. Is there something in the underlying application that you need to change to meet your business needs? Then before we engage in modification, consider all of the costs and the long run effects of what we're about to do. And we really need to ask ourselves, is it worth it? and do a true cost-benefit analysis. And quite frankly, a lot of times, this is where companies come to the conclusion, you know, there's nothing in the software that matches up with exactly what we need, but it's really not worth changing the software 
maybe it would just be better for us to change the way we do things because that's an easier and less costly solution to this whole problem. But we do have the option of modification if we deem it to be worth it. The other question, if what we need to do, if what you need is something that is different from the functionality already in the pre already present in the system, then we can engage in customer development. So this would be my example of the rail car management system where we, we needed that functionality, there was nothing in the system that afforded us that, and so we can go in and just a, and make that part of our environment. The most important part of all of this is to realize, you know, every company should have a process for change management in their IT infrastructure. You don't want a developer just on his or her own deciding to go in and change some stuff. So the idea here is this is something that we need to do with great deliberateness to make sure that we truly do count the cost, we truly do consider the long run effects of what we're doing, and we make these decisions very, very consciously. That's why it's very common in most organizations where an end user might come to the IT department and say, can you make our software do this? And before that change will be made, there'll be a committee that meets that reviews the proposal, figures out how much it will cost, decides if it's an appropriate change, and then when they decide that it is, then they empower a developer or team of developers to actually make the change to the system. Questions about any of this? All right, let's start talking about ABAP. What is ABAP? SAP is a German company. So ABAP is actually I don't know whether it's considered an abbreviation or an acronym, but it's one of those two things. And in fact, what it stands for is that right there, which I will not attempt to pronounce for you. But if we translate that into English, what it stands, what that roughly would translate as generic report preparation slash generation processor. ABOP. Oh, and by the way, now if you look on their website, they tell you that ABOP stands for Advanced Business Application Program. I love that SAP does this. It's like SAP sometimes on their own seems to forget that they're a German company, and so they like take abbreviations that were based on something in the German language and create an American equivalent and tell you, oh yeah, it stands for that. You know, and just, you know, it, it's kind of funny to me because you know, really it stands for that German thing there at the top because that's what it was when they created it, but now they'll tell you, oh no, it stands for Advanced Business Application Program. I suppose that's to make us English speaking people happy and, and, and make us think that the world revolves around English and that German doesn't even exist here. By the way, we will see a lot of German this semester, none of which do I understand, but it's not unusual in the SAP source code to see blocks of comments in, in German and a lot of the field names in the database tables are German. So we'll see a good bit of that this semester. SAP originally created ABOP as a tool for users to use to go in and create custom reports. But they kind of fell in love with their own programming language. And they eventually converted it from something that could just be used for creating custom reports into a full-blown programming language. And in fact, the first version of SAP was written in some other programming language. I have no idea what it was. But SAP R, their first version of the program, was written in some other language. I don't know whether it was COBOL or Fortran or whatever, but it was written in something else. Well, they created ABAP as a part of that, and they liked ABAP so much that when they rewrote the code, they rewrote the code in ABOP. So SAP ERP is written in ABOP. And ABOP is a full Turing complete programming language, which means we can do anything in ABOP that you can do in any other programming language. Now, SAP did something really interesting. Remember, German company, 
you know, here in the United States, we're, we're talking a lot these days about teaching elementary school children how to program. We're like decades behind Germany in that regard because when SAP invented ABBA, they actually went to the German government and said, you should teach this in school. Why don't you teach all the German kids how to program in ABBA? And, and they weren't successful with that argument. But they tried to make it to be kind of a big programming language that um, you know people would learn how to program in. Never caught on, but it is a fully valid Turing complete programming language just like any other programming language that, that, that you have worked with. ABAP is notable for things like its database abstraction. We're going to write a lot of code this semester that goes in and works with database tables. How much code do we have to write to go in and connect to the database system and, and prepare the environment and all of that? Zero. You basically are writing right on top of the database. You will not find another programming language out there that makes it easier for us to do database development and because of the database abstraction built right in. So ease of database interaction, we write code that has SQL statements in it. So you're gonna get to write some queries this semester to brush up on your database programming. ABAP is also platform independent, meaning you can run ABAP on a Windows machine, you can run it on a Linux machine, you can write it on pretty much any major operating system platform out there because SAP will run on just about any major operating system platform out there. ABAP started out, as we were talking about a few moments ago, as a procedural programming language. But in the late 90s, when object-oriented programming began to catch on, ABAP added support for objects. And they called it, not surprisingly, ABAP objects. This is real similar to what happened with C, where C, which was a procedural language, decided to add support for objects and became C++. C++ is basically C with object-oriented uh, folded into it. Well, now ABAP allows both procedural and object-oriented ABAP. Now, in fact, object-oriented is recommended, but legacy procedural coding is still supported. Let me tell you a story that I have uh, heard repeated by many, many companies that I have talked with. They tell me, you know, we've been running SAP for a while, and we have a lot of ABAP developers. And a lot of those ABAP developers have been doing ABAP development for a pretty long time, you know, over a decade. And they're really, really good. But they don't understand object-oriented programming. And we set them to a lot of classes, and they probably on some level understand it. But the code they write, they like to write object or they like to write procedural code. So what we have decided to do is all the old people can keep writing the procedural code and then when we bring in the new people like your graduates, they can write the, the object-oriented code. And so eventually over time, all those other people will retire and we'll move strictly to an object-oriented shop. I, I, I've heard that story from multiple companies in this region and a lot from outside of this region. Fact is, you can write both procedural and object-oriented ABAP. I may wind up repeating this point on a later slide, so I apologize if I do, but let me mention here as well. SAP is very concerned about backwards compatibility. This is enterprise information system software. It cannot break. It cannot go down. It has to perform. So anytime SAP changes the language, they add new things, and they may say about other things, don't do this anymore, but the code will still work. Unlike programming languages that sometimes will say, this technique is no longer supported, and if you use it in your code, it, it won't compile, ABAP's not that way. There are companies running ABAP code that was written in, in the 80s. 
The language has changed significantly since then, but that old code runs without a hitch. Because any time SAP has added new things, they've kept all the old things in place. Now, the one thing, though, that SAP has done that's unique is when they moved into the world of object-oriented program, they said, you know, some of the procedural stuff doesn't make sense in the object-oriented world. So there are some things that if you try and put in your code, you'll get a message back that says you can't do this in object-oriented ABBA. You could do it in procedural, but not in object-oriented. We, of course, always want to follow the preferred techniques. And so even though the old stuff technically works, we don't want to write our code that way. So be very sensitive to when you see things in the documentation that say this is deprecated. Stay away from that. You know, don't, don't use that. You develop your ABAP code in the SAP GUI. So the same SAP GUI that you're, uh, you have used for playing ERP SIM or doing SA, other SAP related work, that's where you do your ABAP programming. Uh, there's a, a transaction code that launches the ABOP workbench. We were in there just a second ago. We'll use it quite extensively uh, this semester. Oh, and by the way, I gave you a, I, I talked about this vaguely, but I see in my notes here. Um, according to the book, ABOP Objects, um, SAP ERP is over 200 million lines of ABOP code. So it is a, it is a big, big beast of a program. How do people learn ABOP? There are, like I said, about a dozen books on ABOP that you could buy from Amazon or perhaps check out of the library. The challenge with that is you need a development environment to practice on. There was a time when you could go out to the SAP website and download a development environment and install it on your laptop. It was not an easy thing to do, and I don't even know if that's out there. So one of the things that's nice for you as a part of taking this course is you're going to get a full-blown ABOP development environment, just like companies in this area would have. But what companies will typically do is they will hire you, and let's say you knew nothing about ABOP development and they wanted to make you an ABOP developer, they would send you to classes. And this is considered part of the SAP NetWeaver curriculum. So give me a second to get this web page pulled up here. And, and we will see, after a moment, that there's a whole bunch of different courses that you can take from SAP training. And down here is the Programming ABOP. And we have SAP NetWeaver Programming Core. So let's look at this for a second. And you get this little nice little tree. This kind of looks like a you know, prerequisite tree or something like that you might see here at ETSU. And in fact, just like here at the university, every one of these courses has a, has a course number. SAP Tech, BC100, BC400, BC401, BC402, BC405. And you'll notice these are all classes with a designated number of days. So let's say, for example, your company hired you and would consider, most people would consider BC400 as the default first course to put someone in. Well, just like here at the university, you have some prerequisites for that. So uh, this right here, there's one of these, I think it's BC100, that basically teaches you what programming is and what a variable is. And I mean, it's like stuff that you would have done back when you very, very first started programming. Two days means you go sit in a classroom from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. and then you have a class and you go home and you work all night on homework. You come back the next day, do it again. That whole class is packed into two days. But keep in mind, eight to five, nine hours, that's 18 hours of class time. Um, five day class, so you can see, you know, that's about 45 hours of class time. You have, you have this whole tree here. Now you couple this with the fact, let's say you wanted to take uh, BC 400, and I haven't looked at this recently, let's see what we find here. 
Okay, VC400 um, costs uh, $1,340. And you're going to have to go to Dallas to take it. So your company's going to have to fly you to Dallas, pay for you to live in a hotel, um, you know, pay this much for the course, and um, you, you will learn class BC 400. That gives you enough knowledge to be dangerous. What do we cover in this course, and how does it relate to, to this tree right here? I have benchmarked our course against BC, I'm going to have to fix the fact that this looks fuzzy, I apologize for that, BC 100, BC 400, BC 401, BC 402, which is one of these right here, and, and BC 430. Our course content will parallel those courses. If you were to take those courses, first of all, you probably would not pay for them. Um, but if your company put you through all of those courses, that would be 58 days of coursework, uh, 464 class hours, and would cost over $20,000. Okay? Or you could take this class here at ETSU. Okay? Your choice. Now, this is why I'm telling you that you're potentially attractive to an employer. Because you can walk in day one, and first of all, they can start sending you to more advanced courses. Or what's really fun is there's a company in this area that's hired one of our students. He now teaches these courses on site for them. Um, you know, you have a lot of different options there that are going to save your company a lot of money. The other thing that's really attractive about you guys is sometimes companies will hire people and they'll send them away for all of this training and then people will say, I don't want to be an op op developer and they'll quit. Or they'll go to work for another company. You know, they'll go to work for another company and now that company's out that money. So you walk in the door with a lot of knowledge that a graduate from NC State's not going to have. A graduate from the University of Tennessee is not going to have. And companies in this area know that about our graduates. Companies from outside of this area may not know that about our graduates, but would be very, very happy to learn that about our graduates. So there's a tremendous opportunity here for you to leverage what we're going to do in this course in a way that would be very valuable. Let me cover one more slide here. And let me say as well, there's a homework assignment out in D2L. I didn't think we would get the material covered that we need to for you to be able to do that homework assignment. So even though it says that it's due tomorrow night, I'm going to push it back. So don't worry about that. Uh, just focus on your reading and stuff right now. You notice that the ABOP stuff we were looking at a moment ago talked about NetWeaver. Wh what's NetWeaver? Some of you may have seen some of this already. But NetWeaver is the technical foundation that all SAP applications are built on. SAP ERP, SAP CRM, SAP SCM, all of those applications are built on top of, of NetWeaver. NetWeaver, you could think of like plumbing. It connects all these applications together and facilitates the overall ability to develop and program in the environment. It, it eases the integration. It provides a framework for development. Well, what is most relevant for us in this class is this down here, this application platform. And notice it says application platform, database and operating system abstraction, which I talked about a moment ago. I talked about database abstraction. I didn't necessarily talk about operating system abstraction, but I did say it doesn't matter what operating system you run on. But then notice this right here. J2EE and ABOP. Well, what's, what's the deal here? You can develop in the SAP environment in Java and ABOP. Now, here's the thing. What you can do in Java is extremely limited. There's a lot of stuff you might want to be able to do in Java that you just can't. ABOP gives you the full run of the system. Companies can run 
either what is called the single stack or a dual stack installation. Single stack installation means I run ABAP. Dual stack means I run support for both of these programming environments. I can't give you any solid statistics, but I'm gonna guess that most companies out there are running a dual stack implementation. Don't really know why you wouldn't in the contemporary environment. But do be aware when you hear people talking about doing Java development in SAP ERP, you can do that. But there's going to be some things that you cannot do. Java development is more oriented towards user interface and less oriented to database related work. ABAP, we can do everything. We are out of time, so we will have to stop here. Any questions before we call our time to a close? All right, I'll put up in D2L the video uh, later today. And remember, I'm gonna push back the homework. So my encouragement to you is don't, don't mess with it until I can show you some things when we next get together. Have a great afternoon, everyone, and I'll look forward to seeing you next time.